All right, what is happening with the amount of carbohydrates people are trying to take on board these days in endurance exercise? As a PhD sports scientist who researched intently, my PhD was around carbohydrate fat metabolism and the manipulation of those two macronutrients to enhance metabolic flexibility. Metabolic flexibility being your ability to be flexible in how you are able to generate ATP within an exercise setting, endurance exercise and most prominently ultra endurance exercise or something lasting longer than, than four hours. I also did 20 minutes and, and other such exercise intensities and durations. But for the most part, I was looking at how can we manipulate carbohydrate and fat to get a, the best case scenario in uh, an endurance athlete. So where I was at with with my whole understanding of things was that we had an upper limit of our carbohydrate oxidation rates and that set was that was set at around 1.5 grams per minute which equates to 90 grams an hour and that was as you may be aware the previous upper recommendation of what people should take on board 90 grams an hour and it's like if you start going above that we start to hit uh ingestional issues so uh, the ingestion of the the carbohydrate source at the intestines or the gastrointestinal tract so if we start to go above that we start to get nauseous and we start to have um, GI issues so then we were able to integrate multiple transportable forms of carbohydrate through fructose and glucose and the manipulation of those concentrations, which since kind of moved on in those, uh, which I'll show you in those concentrations. But for the most part, it was like, look, for me, I was recommending 40 to 60 grams an hour through a drip feed method. The, the less more often is better than one, you know, an entire taking, say, as an extreme three gels at once so that was that was where we were at until very recently now we're hearing reports of 180 grams an hour 140 grams we're talking like seven gels eight gels an hour equivalent not saying that that's exactly what's coming in but that just seems outrageous so where is this being stemmed from and how have we got in here and should you be trying to enhance your carbohydrate intake for a better performance? If I bring up uh, so this study where we have, um, I know the guy who did this, uh, Tim, I haven't spoken to him about this, I haven't spoken to him for a couple of years, just being both sports scientists, we've spoken to each other, increased exogenous but unaltered endogenous carbohydrate oxidation with combined fructose maltodextrin ingestion at 120 grams an hour versus 90 grams an hour at different ratios. Look, what are the main thing I want to show you here is so yeah they compared uh, 120 grams versus 90 grams. 90 grams being the traditional upper limit of what you could ingest, absorb, and utilize, and then they've compared that to uh, the two grams a minute of uh, carbohydrate, so 120 grams an hour. And they've done that with a fructose multidextrin. Multidextrin is just a short chain uh, glucose molecules linked together. So what I want to show you here is just something that happens in every single study where we maximally enhance carbohydrate intake uh, so those of you listening you're not going to be able to see this but really there's four graphs here so there's total carbohydrate oxidation with 120 grams it's higher so we have a higher oxidation rate in terms of grams per minute in total this is total carbohydrate oxidation of around uh i'd have to have a look if they actually mentioned it but it's it's around 3.6 grams a minute then we go on to graph B, which is fat oxidation. This is what we see time and time again. Higher carbohydrate intake, lower fat oxidation. This is because based off of the highly trained individuals that they had in the study, they have enhanced metabolic flexibility, which means the energetic output that is required for the given workload, whether it's running 40, you know, a four-minute um, four K, whether it's pushing 280 watts on the bike, whether it's swimming at two minutes per hundred, whatever your output is, 
there's that energy associated. If you're metabolically flexible, you'll find the most efficient way to get that energy and whether it's fat or carbohydrate and you'll just kind of manipulate the outputs or inputs of those two. Then we're on to graph C, exogenous carbohydrate oxidation. Not surprisingly, the high carbohydrate intake, 120 grams an hour, is higher than the 90 grams an hour. And unsurprisingly, it peaks out on average at 1.5 grams per minute, which is the 90 grams an hour total oxidation rate. The 90 grams an hour of intake is slightly low in terms of the oxidation rate. Not unsurprising because there's a carbohydrate oxidation efficiency or carbohydrate intake efficiency. You never burn 100% of what you took in uh, just because there's going to be some metabolic loss. Then, this is another thing we see time and time again. Endogenous carbohydrate oxidation rate in terms of grams per minute. The graphs are stacked. They're straight on top of, an, top of each other. Endogenous being your stored glycogen. There is no significant difference. There's almost no difference whatsoever between 120 grams versus 90 grams in terms of how much glycogen you would be using or the participants in this study have been using uh, during their exercise intensity. And this is not new findings. We can go back to, I believe this was 2007, and what we're finding here is that they took on 2.5 or 2.44 grams per minute. So that was around 145 grams an hour. And it was very much the same. So what they found was that if we talk uh, about the oxidation rates, it was just the more carbohydrate you took on, the more carbohydrate you burnt. Interestingly, in this study, it was actually a higher anaerobic component. So there's higher blood lactate, significantly higher blood lactate in the higher carbohydrate intake group versus the standardized carbohydrate intake group, either the placebo or the 60 grams, uh, one gram per minute. Now, some people had pointed to that the there was a lower VO2 in terms of oxygen cost of exercising at the fixed intensity was lower with higher carbohydrate intake, glucose fructose mix. Yes, definitely. There's always going to be a, high, a lower oxygen cost when there is a higher lactate production because there is a higher anaerobic component. Tim found that in that study that I'd referenced earlier. And so all this is really to say that where are we now in terms of like what, what should we be doing with this oxygen, like with this increased carbohydrate intake? Because... The data is still coming out. If we just have a look at Tim's uh, conclusion, the results suggest that ingesting of 120 grams an hour at a 0.8 to 1 fructose multidextrin ratio as compared with 90 grams an hour in a 2 to 1 ratio. So again, in this one, it's not like versus like because there's not a direct control. He mentions that in his um, in his like limitation of findings. Offers higher exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates, but no additional sparing of endogenous carbohydrates. Further studies should investigate performance effects, which they've done. There hasn't been any. And so really what we can see is an inter-individual variability is that some people, when I saw this in my studies as well, can oxidize, oxidize these really high rates of carbohydrate. So they can oxidize these two and a half grams per minute or this, um, so what is that, like 140 odd, uh, 50, 150 grams an hour of carbohydrate. So with an oxidation efficiency, which Tim showed in that study, reduces with the higher carbohydrate intakes. So that means like the more you take in, the less of it you burn. So it becomes a point of diminishing returns. And even in that 2007 study, uh, what did they say? No, this is Tim saying, there appears to be a curvilinear dose-response relationship between ingestion of multiple transportable carbohydrate and exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates with exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates peaking just above 1.5 grams per minute or 90 grams an hour, even when carbohydrate intake is higher. 
So, um, and he's referenced Gonzalez 2017 and Raul Rollins, who was one of my PhD supervisors in 2015. So what they're saying there, uh, curvilinear is like, it, there's, a, there's a point at which there's a rapid increase, right? So if you're going from zero to the 90 grams, then when you start, so when you start to go above the 90 grams, it's, it's starting to plateau again, right? So, so what does this mean? It means that we've got to look first of all at the mechanism of exercise because a lot of this is coming from triathletes and cycling and it's coming from triathletes on the bike. When we're looking at uh, cycling, we're looking at a non-weight bearing sport where you're sat on the bicycle so there's less jostling, let's say, which makes it a lot harder when we're trying to compare with runners trying to take on those loads of carbohydrates. You're just not going to be able to absorb the same amount. We also, in cycling, have a higher rate of convectional cooling. That is, you're traveling really fast, and these days they're traveling even faster. So the rate at which you move through the air is really fast and helping you offload some heat. So there's less or potentially less peripheral blood flow needed to offload heat and therefore more uh, internal or um, what would it be like blood flow around your vital organs and the gastrointestinal tract available for absorption so with that we also then have to look at relative intensity that we're operating at because when we're looking at cycling we're looking at say a tour de france you know, these guys are riding at well under like 100 beats a minute or well under kind of, even they would average like under 100 watts when these guys are capable of riding one hour at like 400 watts. And they'll just do, you know, the the uh, leaders especially are trying to do as little as possible until the climb. So yes, it's very possible that they can absorb ridiculously high carbohydrate intakes. Then when we're looking at, the, the bike and the Ironman, we are, look, if we look at someone like Magnus Deeplift, who is massive, he's like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, uh, so that would be, you know, close to two metres tall, and he's uh, probably 80 to 85 kgs, so anyway, there's a larger sink there, there's a larger muscle sink to store carbohydrate, so there's the potential for him, he's one of the ones who's been reported or at least said he's going to take on aim to take on 180 grams he's also sponsored by the feed who sells a lot of this product as well so whatever he has no reason to lie um other than you know selling some product but the point is he may be one individual who's able to oxidize these really high rates and if he is sure he is he just lowering his fat oxidation or is he able to enhance his overall energetic output at a relative intensity which is what the Norwegians have claimed is possible with these higher carbohydrate intakes but it's definitely not going to be the same for everyone and it's definitely not going to be the same capacity for running so when we are looking at uh, running and you know it's a running with Dr. Will podcast I can't really see any evidence to recommend anything above 90 grams an hour The risk you run above 90 grams an hour is your inability to absorb the the carbohydrate you're taking on, then getting intestinal or GI issues and actually like generating a higher concentration of electrolytes carbohydrate in your gut than in your circulating blood. And that would actually draw water away from the blood into the intestines, causing all the bloating and uh, you know GI issues you may have experienced within a race. So that's that's where we're at. That's where we're at in terms of the science. Um, this is just something that I've wanted to look into and kind of get off my chest in terms of you know running specifically. And so if you have not been able to test yourself with your uh, oxidation rates in a lab, which you could do during um, essentially like a VO2 max test, but we'd call it a submax test. And it's relatively crude because unless you're going to uh, isotopically label uh, like a C13 or the, the carbon atoms in the carbohydrates that you're taking on so we can directly see what kind of uh, 
we can lay, we can test the label of what's been um, blown off from what has been ingested and oxidized and then breathed out via the CO2 because some of that will be labeled. We don't, we don't really know. So sure, you can, the other thing is you can always just trial. You can trial taking on 100, 120 grams an hour if you would like, but know that you're, it's that curvilinear. You are definitely diminishing returns beyond 90 grams an hour. And there's doesn't seem to be any recommendation like need for me as a sports scientist in this field of metabolic physiology and performance to recommend anything above that for you. So that's, that's where we are. I'm not getting into carbohydrate loading and uh, like how, glycogen concentration rates are or concentration starting concentrations are associated with performance enhancements or contractile capability and fatigue within the excitation contraction couple that uh is a topic for another day so i'll leave you there i hope you enjoyed that one (laughs) cheers